Melanie Nadia Etchie, known to her family and closest friends as Mel, was a vibrant and lively young woman in New Liskard, Ontario. Her deeply woven empathy for others and a passion for dance and artistic expression were cut short by an unexplainable, unsolved disappearance in September of 1996, leaving all who knew her grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of Melanie Etchier's disappearance near the Armstrong Street Bridge and the endless enigmas of small town Canada. This is Cold Case Detective. Melanie Etchier was born on Christmas Day, 1980, in the province of Ontario, Canada. From an early age, Melanie was left to be raised by her mother, Celine Etchier, after her birth father moved away from the family and refused to remain in contact. Thus, Mel and her mother forged a tight-knit relationship and grew close as Melanie ventured through childhood. As Mel neared adolescence, she found a deep-rooted passion for the arts, specifically dance. Her mother enrolled her in dance classes all around Ontario, whether it be after-school programs or private lessons on weekends. Melanie was specifically attracted to both ballet and Highland dance styles. After years of meticulous training and honing her skills, Melanie was a superb ballerina by the time she reached high school, and when she wasn't showing off her ballet moves, she was scoring high marks with her Scottish Highland sets, a popular form of dance originating from Scotland in the 18th and 19th centuries. These passions for dance eventually evolved into a love of roller skating as well, one of Mel's favorite pastimes was tagging along with friends for a Friday night at the roller rink, and would even compete in friendly competitions as an amateur roller skater. Regardless of the means of expression, Mel loved all things dance, and it was fair to think that wherever the music was playing, Melanie would be there dancing right along with it. By the 1990s, Melanie and Celine moved to a small town of only about 5,400 people called New Liskert in Ontario. Located right on the edge of the Ontario-Quebec border, next to Lake Temiskaming, and is an ideal village for people looking for a low-key escape from city life for a quiet, sleepy town to raise a family. New Liskard isn't exactly known for its buzzing nightlife or entertainment venues, but the youth of Temiskaming Shores find ways to socialize and come together to entertain themselves throughout the year when they're not in school. Melanie fit right in in that regard. When she wasn't hanging out with friends and creating her own adventures, she was studying hard and receiving top marks at school. As a freshman and sophomore at St. Marie, Melanie was an honors student, and her teachers always raved about her work ethic and enthusiasm in helping others. This compassion and empathy bled into Melanie's home life as well. In the early 90s, Celine Etchier gave birth to another baby girl named Jessie. Mel quickly fell in love with her new little sister and acted as a second mother, aiding Celine with household chores and guiding Jessie from infancy to childhood. Through these endeavors, Melanie discovered a true calling towards tending to the new Liskard youth and secured a job at a nearby daycare during high school. It was the perfect supplement as Melanie entered adulthood. Work and school, combined with furthering her dance repertoire, taking self-defense classes, and balancing recreation with her group of friends, all contributed to a busy yet fulfilling life for Mel. That is, until just weeks into her junior year at St. Marie, when Melanie left her friend's house among the suburbs of New Liskard and disappeared into the thick of night, never to be seen or heard from again. Let's now turn to the timeline of events that led to Melanie's baffling disappearance. 
The morning of Saturday, September 28th, 1996, starts out like any other autumnal weekend. Melanie wakes up and makes plans with a few of her friends from school. Later that afternoon, Melanie and her best friend visit a few different locations around New Liscot, simply enjoying each other's company and running various errands. At some point before dinner time, Melanie stops at a bakery and buys a cake pan and a birthday cake for her grandmother's birthday celebration, scheduled for the next day. After the cake purchase, Melanie and her friend meet up with Melanie's relatively new boyfriend, three of his friends, and one of their girlfriends. As dusk turns to night, the girlfriend of one of the boys departs the group and heads home. Not ready to end the night out, the rest of the teenagers venture into a video rental store at some time between 9 and 9.30 p.m. At around 10 p.m., Mel brings her friends back to her house in New Liscot to watch the movie they rented. However, before they can do so, Celine tells her daughter that her room is not clean enough to bring in any visitors. Melanie turns to her friends and says they can find somewhere else to watch the film, and the group leaves the Etchier residence. This is the last time Celine sees or speaks to Melanie. A little after 10 p.m., Melanie and company arrive at the home of one of her boyfriend's friends, located on Pine Avenue, a 12-minute, six-block walk from Mel's house. At just around the same time, another one of the boyfriend's friends decides to go home for the evening and says goodbye. Between 10 and 10.30, the remaining teenagers go down to Melanie's boyfriend's basement to watch the film, while the boyfriend's parents sleep upstairs. Before the end of the movie, possibly around 11.30 p.m. or midnight, another one of the party returns home. After another 30 minutes or so pass by, at approximately 12.30 a.m., Mel's best friend, whom she had hung out with all day until that moment, leaves the boyfriend's house to catch her ride waiting to take her back to Haleybury. As she walks away from the Pine Avenue home and through the intersection nearby, she notices a vehicle slowly approaching her from behind, with suspicious figures seated in the car. Melanie's friend runs the remaining distance to where her ride is parked, spooked by the eerie activity of the crawling vehicle. Meanwhile, back on Pine Avenue, an hour goes by and the movie finishes. Between 1.30 and 2 a.m., Melanie says goodbye to her boyfriend and his friend, whose family resides in the house, and gets ready to leave. One of the boys walks her to the front door and sees her go outside. They continue watching her as she strolls down Park Avenue East. A few moments later, an unidentified witness spots Melanie walking across the Armstrong Street Bridge, heading south over the river. This is the last confirmed sighting of Melanie Etchier. The next morning, sometime between 6 and 7.30 a.m. on Sunday, September 29th, Celine Etchier wakes up to Melanie's alarm clock blaring in her bedroom. She checks her daughter's room when the alarm isn't switched off and finds Mel's room empty and in the same condition it had been the night before. Thinking Melanie had simply fallen asleep at her friend's house, a common occurrence, Celine turns the alarm clock off and goes about her morning. Later that same day, a little after 12 p.m., Celine receives a call from the daycare where Melanie works, telling her that Melanie never showed up for her shift. This incident does strike Celine as odd, and she immediately phones Melanie's friends from the night before. The friends tell Celine Mel left at around 1.30 a.m., and they haven't heard from her since. Celine then makes one more phone call, this time to the New Liskard Police Service. Police Chief Doug Jelly takes the call, and a missing persons report for Melanie Etchier is officially filed. Between 12.30 and 3 p.m., New Liskard Police send separate units of officers to both the Etchier residence and the Armstrong Street Bridge. No clues are picked up, in the initial hours. The following day, on Monday, September 30th, New Liskard police call in backup from surrounding law enforcement agencies. They receive manpower from the Ontario Provincial Police, a helicopter, as well as police and cadaver dogs. Within the first week of the investigation, police go door to door to speak with local citizens and ask to keep a neighborhood watch for any signs of mal. None of these homes are searched, however, and a few New Liskard residents call in false sightings of Melanie 
when a few other girls in the area, bearing strong resemblances to her, are seen walking around the town. Police interrogate these girls to see if maybe Melanie had been a victim of false targeting, but no evidence of such is uncovered and the girls are let go. On Tuesday, October 8th, police are finally able to execute an underwater search and rescue mission in the local Wabi River. This canvassing lasts for three days between the Armstrong Street Bridge and Lake Temiskaming, but nothing of any note is pulled from the river's depths. Later in October, as the rescue mission bears no fruit, police are left without any evidence of exactly where Mel vanished the night of September 28th. It cannot be determined if she actually went missing on the Armstrong Street Bridge, but it's fairly agreed upon that whatever happened was most likely the result of foul play. 1996 draws to a close, and as the word spreads around the greater Ontario area and Canada as a whole, Mel's fate becomes that much murkier. Over the next few years, detectives spend countless hours interviewing hundreds of potential suspects. They find many new areas to search around New Liskard, but nothing of note is unearthed. In 2004, New Liskard is amalgamated into the city of Temeskaming Shores, and the OPP gains full reign of the Melanie Etchier investigation. In 2010, detectives assigned to Mel's case announced that, up to that point, they had received 700 tips from 500 different supposed witnesses, which led to more than 300 persons of interest. However, none of these tips are made public, and most of the details of the case are kept under wraps outside of the anonymous testimony given regarding Melanie crossing the Armstrong Street Bridge at around 2 a.m. In 2017, both Celine Etchier and authorities come forward and tell reporters they believe Melanie is no longer alive and has been deceased for some time. They do not reveal any new evidence, but still reaffirm their theory that Melanie met with foul play. In 2020, law enforcement declassifies a few documents in the case file. The biggest clue revealed is the testimony from Melanie's best friend regarding a suspicious vehicle parked near Pine Avenue at around 12.30 a.m. on September 29th. As of the present day, detectives are seemingly no closer to solving Melanie Etchier's inexplicable disappearance, despite a few solid theories purported in the quarter century since. She has still yet to be seen or heard from since crossing the Wabi River. In a case void of any known hard evidence or physical clues, the best insight we have into the fate of Melanie Etchier is the eyewitness testimony released in 2010, detailing the final sighting of Mel as she crossed the Armstrong Street Bridge at around 2 a.m. on September 29th. Who gave police this tidbit of information is still classified. However, it has been clarified this witness is not one of the original friends who watched a movie with Mel at the Pine Avenue residence a few hours prior. So who could this eyewitness be? At first glance, the idea of a sighting near a bridge at this time of night may seem suspicious. If it was unusual for a person of Melanie's age to be out and about, particularly at this time of night, why was this stranger doing so? While it may not be normal for a 15-year-old girl to wander the streets of New Liskard at two in the morning, that section of Armstrong Street near the Wabi River was still an active traffic spot, even at that late hour. There are plenty of cars that drive across the bridge each and every night, and with it being a Saturday night, those spending a weekend in the town would be much more likely to be out and about. The witness could have been one of these people, or could have been coming home from the second shift at a workplace in Temiskaming Shores. It was noted by police at the time that the bars of New Liskard all were closing around the time Mel would have crossed that bridge. It's possible one of the patrons or bartenders at these local pubs made the sighting. It is also possible that one of these patrons could have been complicit in Mel's fate too. The fact that Mel was sighted at all on the night of September 29th does help draw a hypothetical path of her movements prior to vanishing. Her route from the house on Pine Avenue to Armstrong Street is pretty straightforward. In addition, 
The bridge itself is adorned with a fair amount of lighting that would have made spotting a pedestrian using the walkway quite easy. However, it would be the last time along Melanie's theorized route she would have had ample lighting to make a street sighting possible. From here is where investigators and sleuths alike lose Melanie's movements. While she is still only a few blocks from her residence, she does enter the suburbs where there is significantly less artificial light and overhead lamps. There would also be less traffic in the neighborhood back roads, thus less headlights casting light across the streets. Multiple paths could have been taken to get from the Wabi River to the Echie home, and all of them are roughly the same in terms of darkness. It is worth pointing out that the 26th of September featured a full moon, therefore the night of the 28th would have had a nearly full one, providing more natural light than was perhaps usual. While this probably wouldn't give off enough light to provide onlookers with a clear sighting of Melanie, it would provide a potential kidnapper or abductor enough light to operate yet still cloak themselves in the shadows, where they could jump out or attack without detection. This is pure speculation, but since it's near certain Melanie disappeared after crossing that bridge, it seems a reasonable scenario to consider regarding the geography of the area and the elements that night. Now, let's turn to the most prominent theories in explaining Melanie Etchier's unsolved disappearance. From the beginning of the investigation, many concerned citizens wondered if Melanie had been taken by her estranged birth father. They had not remained in contact since Melanie's infancy, but people who think Melanie was coerced to get in a vehicle with someone she knew believe it's a logical choice. After years of silence, Mel's father shows up, hoping to rekindle their relationship, but instead takes her away from her mother and hometown and leaves Canada altogether. It is an understandable gut reaction. However, upon closer inspection, it doesn't quite hold up. Why would he show up in the middle of a Saturday night on a dark side of the street at the end of September? Sure, it could have been a random moment of opportunity, but if Mel's father really wanted his daughter back in his life, he would surely try an alternative form of communication to see if she was interested. Why not call her or try and meet her or Celine to test the waters instead of instantly resorting to kidnapping? After she went missing, there were no testimonies from her friends or Celine herself that Mel's father had tried reaching her in the days leading up to September 28th, making his involvement unlikely. In fact, police ended up tracking him down to follow up on the theory and were able to clear him of any involvement. So if it wasn't Mel's father, is there anyone else specifically who could have swooped through the shadows of the night and abducted Melanie? There were a couple of names thrown out by new Liskard investigators in the years following 1996, including those of Robert Goulet and his half-brother, a man known only by his initials of M.L. About five months before Melanie went missing in April of 1996, a 47-year-old man was murdered by M.L. and Robert Goulet in a town about 20 minutes north of New Liskard. Both M.L. and Goulet were minors at the time, and M.L. had been inappropriately touched by the man they murdered, who was called Louis Gautier. Thus, the two boys were aided by their uncle, Gregory Crick, and Louis Gautier, the abuser of M.L., was murdered. M.L. and Goulet were never captured, however, and eventually Crick grew paranoid that Goulet was hurting their family through his nonchalant actions after the murder. Goulet himself actually went missing in November of 1996. His body was recovered two years later in a gravel pit in Hilliardton, and while M.L. and his uncle Crick were always thought to be responsible, they were arrested in December of 1996 for the Louis Gautier killing instead. You may be wondering how any of this links back to Melanie Etchier outside of the case's geographic proximity. Well, while new Liskard police detectives insist these crimes aren't linked, there have been tips and testimonies to suggest otherwise. One came from an unidentified teenage girl who was a temporary cellmate of ML at a juvenile detention facility in 1998. 
The girl told law enforcement that ML once confessed to killing Etchier in 1996, but ML has since denied this confession or any involvement at all. Another tip came in from an attendee at a house party in October or November of 1996, which Robert Goulet had also attended prior to his murder. This anonymous attendee told police that at this party, Goulet admitted to killing Melanie and getting rid of her body via a wood chipper. Investigators weren't convinced, considering the movie Fargo had been released earlier in the spring of 1996, and its infamous scene was probably fodder for plenty of false confessions like Goulet's. Nevertheless, detectives wiretapped the residences of Goulet, ML, and their uncle Gregory Chick to try and gather any intel based on private conversations. These wiretaps never revealed any information regarding Melanie Etchier or her disappearance, and their potential involvement in the case was dismissed by police. Theories revolving around Goulet and ML do not end there, however, as more and more people wondered if Melanie was actually the victim of mistaken identity, and the perpetrators were looking for someone else who resembled her. It was a known fact in 1996 that Melanie was one of only three young black women living in New Liskard at the time. One of the other three girls, who has only been referred to as Sarah by official documents, bore a very close resemblance to Mel, according to both news reports and New Liskard residents. This second girl named Sarah had been the target of racial abuse and violent threats by two boys around Tamiskaming Shores, and those two boys were none other than Goulet and ML. The theory then purports that Goulet and ML sought out to kill Sarah for real, but mistook Melanie as Sarah due to their similar height, build, and race. Many wonder why Goulet and ML would target Sarah in the first place. Other than racial discrimination, one motivating factor could have been Goulet and ML's drug business. They were known for peddling drugs to the youths of Tamiskaming Shores, and Sarah bought from them on several occasions. Then on September 27th, 1996, less than 48 hours before Mel's disappearance, Sarah told one of her other friends that she owed some money to local drug dealers, and was afraid that if she didn't pay off her debts, they'd kill her. Sarah even went so far as to tell this friend that it wouldn't be a surprise if she went missing that following weekend. Another interesting element to add into the mix is that Sarah had been known prior to the 27th for her teamwork with local police agencies, acting as an informant on a separate group of three boys who were dealing drugs around town. The suspicions didn't end there either. Sarah also just happened to live on Pine Avenue, the same road where Mel spent her last night with her boyfriend at his friend's house. Now, Sarah wasn't a part of the crew that night, but some wonder if the car that had been parked near the house on the night of the 28th, the same suspicious vehicle that spooked Mel's best friend, was driven by the supposed drug dealers that were looking for Sarah. Unfortunately, the story muddies up from that point forward. Sarah learned of Mel's disappearance on the 30th of September, and strangely started telling people around the greater New Liskard area that her name was Melanie. She would dress up in clothes, similar to the ones Mel was wearing the night she disappeared, and went as far as to tell people at the Haleybury Bowling Alley that she was the real Melanie Etchier. The police never acted on these odd behavioral changes, and Sarah eventually moved out of New Liskard in 1998. From North Boy, she later transferred to Vancouver, British Columbia, and has severed all contact with her friends and family back home in Ontario. The situation with Goulet, ML, and Sarah leaves many questions waiting to be answered. Were Goulet and ML really harassing Sarah in the days leading up to Mel's disappearance? Did people really get confused between Sarah and Melanie on a regular basis, or did a few folks come up with that idea simply because they were two of only three black girls in their community? Was that car that scared Mel's best friend driven by Goulet and ML? Did they then track down Melanie after she crossed the Armstrong Street Bridge, believing she was Sarah, and kidnapped her anyway when they realized their mistake? Can we even believe Sarah's story at all? 
considering her false impersonations of Melanie after she went missing. If we do, is it possible Sarah was somehow involved herself? Melanie and Sarah were familiar with each other, but were not good friends. Again, detectives in both the NLPD and OPP say no to all of the above, and insist that none of these coincidences quantify as evidence. The Sarah situation wasn't the only theory to involve a mistaken identity, either. There was another girl in the Temiskaming Shores also named Melanie Etchier, her middle name being Louise rather than Nadia. Melanie Louise was only a year older than Melanie Nadia, and both attended the same secondary school at the same time. Police initially thought Melanie Louise could have been the intended victim, because she was close friends with the girl who was dating ML, and at the time, ML was under investigation. Melanie Louise's mother was also a cousin of Louis Gautier, the man killed by ML and Robert Goulet. So, just as Melanie Nadia could have been mistaken for Sarah because of their appearance, Melanie Nadia could have been mistaken as Melanie Louise because of their name. Upon closer inspection though, it doesn't really make much sense. How could someone mistake Melanie for another girl who is a completely different height, weight, build, and ethnicity? At least Sarah was known to be in close proximity to Melanie's last known movements. Melanie Louise was not. Early on, police wondered if ML, or whoever the perpetrator was, hired a third party to kidnap Melanie Louise, and only told them her first and last name. Then, when these third party criminals looked her up, they accidentally picked out Melanie Nadia Etchier, and that is how the confusion occurred. However, detectives no longer believe Melanie Louise is in any way connected, though she did partake in an interview in 2020, in which she shared with reporters a meeting with ML at a park near their home in the autumn of 1996, in which ML acted anxious and paranoid, asking her if she thought he was involved with the murder of Louis Gautier or the disappearance of Melanie Nadia Etchier. Melanie Louise said at the time she didn't feel like he was responsible, but as of today, does think that ML was involved in both the Gautier and in the Etchier vanishing. Other than Robert Goulet and ML, could there have been any other locals around New Liskard who could have kidnapped Melanie that fateful night? While there aren't any specific names making the rounds, there are a few theories that Mel's abductor was local to Tamiskaming Shores. One popular theory is that Mel was hit by a drunk driver on her walk back home. Because of the poor lighting around the suburbs past the Wabi River, it makes sense that someone attempting to drive under the influence may not see Mel walking and hit her with their out of control car, panicked in the heat of the moment and took her body and got rid of it rather than calling the police. Remember there were multiple bars around New Liskard that were closing for the night at 2am, the patrons who decided to leave drunk could be the culprits. In fact, it was popular for regulars to leave the Ontario bars at 2am and head over to the bars in nearby Quebec, as the laws in Quebec allow pubs to stay open one hour later until 3 in the morning. All that being said, the chances Mel was struck by a car and then removed by a drunkard are slim to none. It is highly improbable that someone drunk enough to swerve off the side of the road and strike a pedestrian would also be cognizant enough to quickly get rid of the body without leaving behind a shred of evidence, nary a drop of blood or tuft of hair. And if Mel was hit by a car, it would have made a pretty loud noise, and neighbours in the surrounding suburbs don't remember hearing any automobile accident that night. There were also two separate NLPD patrol cars stationed outside of the new Liskard bars that night of September 28th, with officers watching over the departing patrons to make sure such accidents wouldn't happen. While it is possible that a patron or two slipped through the cracks of the parked cop's vision, investigators researched all tips that came into their station in the following months about rumours that Mel was hit by a car and dumped in rural landfills and each and every one was found to be inaccurate or completely made up. Another popular theory is that Mel was attacked by one or two strangers from New Liskard in a crime of opportunity, 
In addition to the bars that were still open, there were also a few gas stations in New Liskard open and operating that late at night. Two of them, a Mr. Gas and an Esso station, would have been passed by Mel on her route back home, and there could have been lurking strangers waiting for a chance to attack an unsuspecting woman. There were also a couple of weddings being held at small venues around Temiskaming Shores that weekend in September, and it is possible that the crowds they brought in also brought in a person or two looking for trouble. The most likely theory revolving around suspicious New Liskard locals was born from testimonies given by two girls connected with Mel the day she went missing. The first was by one of the girlfriends of the boys that hung out with Melanie and her boyfriend that Saturday afternoon. She didn't end up going to the Pine Avenue house that night, but rather returned home to walk her dog. While walking her dog at around sunset, a white delivery van pulled up along the side of the road and stopped next to her. The driver and the passenger, two white men in their 30s wearing white tank tops and sporting disheveled appearances, asked the girl for directions. The two men gave off incredibly uncomfortable vibes, and when the girl's dog started barking at the van, the two men drove off without saying anything else. The second testimony involving a white van didn't come until 2020, but occurred the same day as the first. This report was given by a female clerk at the video rental store where Mel and her friends rented the movie they would watch the night of September 28th. The clerk was the sister to one of the boys in Mel's friend group, and remembers covering the price of the movie that night when they came in. An hour later, at around 10.30 p.m., the clerk remembers a white van pulling into a darkly lit slot of the parking lot, and either the driver or the passenger entering the store. The clerk tried assisting the man, but he ignored her requests and loafed around for a few minutes, remaining completely silent. He eventually left and the white van drove away as quickly as it had arrived, but the clerk was unable to get a license plate number as the low light made the front of the vehicle indecipherable. When the clerk finally told reporters of the incident, she described the man as being in his 40s of an average build, standing at either 5'8 or 5'9, sporting dirty blonde hair, unkempt blue work pants and work boots, and a white shirt that was in the process of turning yellow with dirt and sweat. The clerk would end up calling her father to pick her up, feeling too weirded out by the white van to walk home as she usually did. To befuddle investigators even more was an additional report of a suspicious vehicle seen the weekend of September the 28th and 29th in 1996. This car was described as light colored, possibly white, blue, or gray, and could be of a multitude of older models, such as a Cadillac Eldorado, a Ford Thunderbird, or an Oldsmobile 88. It was seen by multiple witnesses driving around New Liskard with its headlights switched off and crawling along side streets, seemingly watching for something. Most notably, it was also sighted on the Armstrong Street Bridge at around 2 a.m., just before or after Melanie crossed the Wabi River. This is all the information we have on this mysterious third vehicle. But a sergeant in the NLPD has since stated that this light-colored model is no longer believed to be connected to the case, or to either the white van or the car seen on Pine Avenue that frightened Mel's friend. However, the men driving those two cars are still seen as active persons of interest. A couple of other theories have also been shut down by investigators, yet are still shared by armchair detectives. These range from discussions about a hunting accident to attacks by white supremacists. While the hunting scene around New Liskard is popular amongst locals and tourists alike, the only types of hunting legalized in the area are small game and bear hunting. Bear hunting was reserved for the springtime in the 1990s, and small game hunting is really only engaged in by nearby residents, never really drawing in outside crowds. Big game hunting is another story, but in Canada, those hunters must stay at a licensed outfitter, and those weren't in operation in Temiskaming Shores in September of 1996. In terms of a white supremacy operation, there were white nationalist groups active in the area at the time of Mel's disappearance, but there had been no reports of hate crimes or other similar acts in New Liskert 
at the time of the investigation, and the white supremacist groups themselves were already heavily monitored by the fall of 1996. While it cannot be ruled out, there just isn't enough evidence to support it at this point in time. The best remaining theories in Mel's disappearance all revolve around three serial killers from the Temiskaming area in the 1990s. The first of these is Richard Bullion, a sexual predator from Quebec who killed his neighbour, a 16-year-old girl called Julie, in 1999. Richard was never arrested due to a lack of evidence, but both the victim's families and law enforcement figured he was their prime suspect. Richard eventually confessed to Julie's murder, along with a handful of other killings while on his deathbed, but was removed as a person of interest in Mel's case when it was confirmed by detectives that he was located eight hours away from New Liscott on the night of September 28th. The second serial killer profiled was Paul Allen Hashi, a middle-aged man convicted of multiple sexual assaults and two murders across Edmonton, Alberta and the province of Ontario. One of the murders was of a 46-year-old man in the Toronto neighbourhood of Rosedale, and the other of a 20-year-old woman in North Bay, Ontario. After his arrest, Paul confessed to a third murder of another middle-aged white man, though police collectively agreed his victim count was higher than he let on. However, his modus operandi does not match Mel's demographic, and he was deemed unlikely to be connected to her case by the OPP. The third and final serial killer was a man by the name of Michael Wayne McGray, a 30-year-old active criminal in the mid-1990s. By 1998, McGray had killed six girls, spanning between the ages of seven and 18, and claimed to have even more victims, upward of 18 in total. He was arrested in November of that year, and investigators examined his purported killings from countless locations across Canada. It was obvious McGray had hopped between provincial cities to cover his tracks, but it was unclear if he had ever been around New Liscard. While Mel's age does fit McGray's MO, it has yet to be clarified if he is actively considered a person of interest. Until a confession comes, or evidence is mounted, he'll have to remain nothing more than one of the hundreds of theories thrown about in a mystery that only seems to grow by the minute. Before we divulge our hypothesis, we want to make it known that our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each episode, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. In the case of Melanie Etchier, we agree with current OPP and NLPD investigators that Mel was most likely a victim of foul play on her walk home from the Pine Avenue gathering she attended that Saturday night of September 28, 1996. More specifically, we believe that Melanie was coaxed into the vehicle of someone she either knew or was at least familiar with. The biggest clue that Mel wasn't simply kidnapped from her feet and forced into the car is the lack of noise heard by neighbors in those early morning hours. Nobody heard the thud of a body hitting a car or the screams of a person as they were dragged away against their will. It was a silent endeavor, which strongly hints that Mel was familiar with her captor. In addition, Melanie was known to be an incredibly agile and athletic person at the time of her disappearance. She was a ballerina after all, and would have put up a fight against an opportunist. And if she saw someone coming before they struck, she would have attempted to run or hide in the shadows of the night. She may even have attempted to stand her ground and was physically capable of handling herself. Whoever hurt her that night could have been operating with a crony or crew of criminals, especially if you give any merit to the sightings of the men in the white van or the men in the suspicious Pine Avenue vehicle at midnight. But remember, there was no sound. So unless Mel was taken by a professional group of child kidnappers, it simply doesn't make much sense. There's also the matter of the time of night and location of Melanie's disappearance that actually dissuades the theories of a random attack. 
While it may seem to make sense that a predator would conceal themselves in the dark of night and jump out at an odd hour to prey upon unsuspecting women, the fact is that Melanie's new Liskard suburb was not exactly known for its prowlers. Melanie also wasn't usually a nighttime walker. She had no routine of walking home alone on Saturday evenings, and there wasn't a pattern for a potential stalker or opportunist to follow. So if Melanie was kidnapped by someone she knew or was familiar with, the question is who? The boys that Mel hung out with the night she went missing have been the focal point of an investigation for years. Detectives claim all the people who hung out with Melanie on the 28th passed lie detector tests, but we all know that doesn't mean much and cannot 100% exclude them from guilt. Of course, these boys have been thoroughly interrogated outside of just a polygraph, and Mel's boyfriend of the time has come out and said how much he regrets not walking her home. But there is still the chance one of his friends could be to blame. If one of the boys who hung out with Mel did not take her themselves, they could have informed someone else of her plans to walk home that night and have someone else from school grab her. Still, while the boys of New Liskard make realistic suspects, the fact of the matter is the who part of the equation is nearly impossible to discern. While most signs point to a level of familiarity between Melanie and her captor, it cannot be determined for sure who took her until a body is found or someone comes forward. Until then, we want to echo the sentiments of those who still fight for Melanie's life, of those who are still out there looking for her in every corner of the world, to Miskaming shores and beyond. We know somebody out there knows something about Mel's fate, and even if it may not seem like a huge clue, it could be the thing investigators need to bring her home and deliver closure for her mother and sister. And even though those closest to the case believe Mel is no longer alive, as with all missing persons cases, there is still a sliver of hope. She could be alive and well wherever she may be, and until proven otherwise, hope will bleed true. It's what Melanie would have wanted, as she was such a beacon of hope for others in the brief time she spent with friends and families. She encompassed that love for others in everything she did, whether it was at dance lessons or the roller rink or the daycare, or just out in the new Liskard community. She was unbelievably clever, her intelligence bound to carry her far into the future. Success, a certainty. It is up to us to make sure that success returns to Melanie Etchier's legacy, to bring justice to a young girl who deserves it tenfold. If you or anyone you know has any information related to Melanie Etchier's disappearance, please contact the OPP to Miskaming Detachment at 1-888-310-1122 or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. This is Cold Case Detective.